Hey, I'm Rob Berger. When I'm not rolling in the dough, that's right, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today, according to my handy dandy every day is a holiday calendar, today is Administrative Professionals Day. Well, all of you out there know that I really run this joint, and Joe and OG work for me, but... If they want to think of me as their administrative assistant, no problem. In fact, Joe and OG probably have a little gift for you-know-who at the end of today's show. But we also have a gift for you today, too, because we're answering your letters. On today's show, how does someone make their house savings earn some money along the way? What is the number one best upgrade you can make to increase your home's value? When is the best time to save into a Roth IRA? We'll answer all of these, throw out the Haven Lifeline, and still leave time for my incredible trivia. And now, two guys who are the best bosses ever. I think that'll supersize my gift. Joe and O J J J J G. I've got a whole bunch of those uh, really old McDonald's coupons we could give them. The ones you know, that like came in like the rice. the ones that came in like the little booklet. Yeah, they were like a dollar each. You'd like tear off the perforation, right? <laughs> Here's my dollar coupon. I'm not surprised you have those. Looking at your desk, I bet you've you've had those forever. And might... I mean, looking at my side of the table here, this is this is a well organized machine over here. You might have never looked at the expiration date. Those those might be slightly expired. Hey, everybody, Just welcome to the uh, McDonald's. It's like the milk in my fridge. <laughs> welcome to the Mc- McDonald's Coupon Podcast. I'm Joe Sell, See High Average Show Money on Twitter. And across the table from me, the highly organized, he has the sweater vest on today, OG. I've been wearing this quite a bit lately. I don't know if you've noticed, but this is my new uniform. It, it, it might be time to wash it if you've been wearing it a lot lately. <laughs> Look what I got. I got the Stacky Benjamin's Financial Ed t shirt which everybody should get, stackybenjamins.com forward slash shirts. How about that? As if we made any money on those. We make zero, but they sure are fun. Brad does a, does a heck of a job. We we'll got a great you, friends. We got a great show, though, today, OG. We've got so many letters to answer, and we're going to attack that today. We're going to do that. We're also going to, well, Doug already told you what we're going to do. But I got to tell you first, big thanks to Slack for helping us stay organized here in the basement. I was so excited that they decided they wanted to team up with us. Slack's a collaboration hub, if you don't know who they are, that lets you and I organize our team's work into channels where everybody's included, relevant information is in one place, and new team members can easily get up to speed. Learn more at slack.com. And we're also brought to you by Magnify Money. You know, the average person saves 450 bucks by getting the right tools that they use every day, like checking accounts, savings accounts, consolidation loans, the best credit cards. If you're playing the reward game, Nick over at Magnify Money says, if you're getting less than 2% and you're playing the reward game, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. And man, between Slack being organized and Magnify Money having money, we've already started people off on the right foot, OG. This show now is downhill from here. Our work here is done. <laughs> we, we're done. We've if, already made your money. I know. And, uh, we're out of here. If we help Time anybody, to cash in those McDonald's coupons. We right. help anybody the rest of the day. It's like icing on the cake. So let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show: our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline today comes to us from Napa Net. That's the National Association of Plan Advisors. And by the way, this piece, and the reason I like using, for those of you that uh, are new to the show, we go to this site quite a bit, Napa-Net, and it's because they kind of, it's more geared toward financial advisors and financial professionals. And I often find there's a big difference between what professionals are looking at and what the public's looking at. When I first made the transition over from financial planner to more financial media, I was surprised by the wide gulf. Like, why are you guys talking about all this junk Because this other stuff's really important, right? But this one is kind of just pulling the the, uh, curtain back a little bit, OG. These are three must-do marketing steps for advisors to stand out from the crowd. Um, And they talk about what to... And I thought we could talk about... Because I I look at all of these 
And I think people need to know like what financial advisors do to market and really how to find your best advisor. Uh, without reading Ted Godbout's complete article, thank you. He starts off with seminars to workshops. He said, Denoyer noted his firm started holding seminars as a way to continuously add to their marketing pipeline and build a foundation for their other marketing programs. And while holding seminars might not quite seem like uncharted territory, he explained that what makes their effort different is the level of detail that goes into planning and executing them. We go into it with a passion of helping as many people impact their employees' lives as possible, Denoyer said. One slight but important change his firm implemented was promoting the events as workshops instead of seminars. It's, it's funny. Instead of a seminar, we're going to call it a workshop. Well, I mean, to your point, from a marketing standpoint, that's a pretty big difference, right? Do you want to go to a financial seminar or would you prefer to go to a financial workshop? But if you treat it like a workshop, like I think for me, the best marketing always was when I help people get their hands dirty and actually yeah. dig into their financial plan. When it was me up there doing a dog and pony show, smoke and mirrors thing, it was horrible. But when everybody kind of got their hands dirty and had to write down their goals and specify a few milestones and start kind of building the plan so they had some of the basics, I thought that was way better. Not just better marketing, but people got a lot more out of it. Well, they get a lot out of it. And they, again, from a marketing standpoint, they're self-identifying where their restrictions are, right? So you may have somebody in the audience that if, if you're doing a workshop, that's good to go, right? And you want them to recognize that they've done a great job, you know, and to keep it on, keep it on, so to speak. But then by the same token, if somebody needs help, they're identifying right there that, hey, I've, I've got a restriction here. Let's dive into something not often talked about, which is these uh, tickets people get in the mail. You and I have both been involved in these before. Se for seminars? Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah for, for a free dinner seminar. I want to explore that for a second. How about those? I'm totally going to the next one I get invited to, by the way. Are you going to sit in the, sit in the front row? <laughs> people did it to me. Time paybacks, man. Yep, so so there are firms out there that uh, give advisors like lists of people and they're able to specify, I want people that are in this zip code that probably have this net worth. And I don't know where they get this information from, but it's, it's usually pretty spot on. Pretty accurate. Yep. And then uh, when people go to these, I've seen the range of these from great to horrible. Like I'm a guy in the past with my career, I used to be the hired gun that would come in and advisors would have me come in and I do most of the talking. And my job was to build up the people that didn't talk as much as I did as great at their job. And so even the ones I did, OG, I, sometimes I was there representing phenomenal people and other times it was my job. And I was told I had to go to X place and do Y seminar. I, I mean, the, the quality of these varies a ton. Quality of the advisor, the quality of the both workshop. the quality yeah. of the presentation. Well, in the ones I did, the quality of the workshop was brilliant. But what, <laughs> what you were going to what you were going to get after that yeah. was was a wide, wide, uh, wide margin. Well, I think that uh, especially with the free dinner seminar thing, I don't think they're bad. But I think that you have to recognize what the angle is, and you can usually tell pretty early. I was just having a conversation with a client a week ago about this. I can usually tell if you listen to like the Saturday morning financial programs, right? And obviously you've listened to a couple before. You can usually tell within like 10 minutes exactly what their angle is. Yeah. Right. Like all doom and gloom, fear and panic. They sell fixed index annuities. Right. Guaranteed. hundred percent. Right. That's all they do. Right. right? That's right. <laughs> and that's how they make money, you know, so that's their deal. But um, so, so you got to kind of figure out what the angle is, so to speak. What, they're, occasion, what they're really selling. Yeah. And on occasion, You've got the full kind of comprehensive wealth management solution that's being presented, so to speak. But the vast majority of the dinner, free lunch, senior seminars are product specific, right? Because they've got it wired. Those guys that do that all the time and gals that do that all the time, they know if I do X number of seminars with X number of people at the seminar, I'm going to X number of sales, wash, rinse, repeat. It's a numbers game, you're saying. Oh, my goodness. When in my office in Michigan, there was a guy that had a suite above me and he moved in and he moved in like all this like high end stuff, right? Like I'm watching him move in. He's got televisions and big oak tables and everything. And I'm thinking, well, this guy's a big shooter, you know? 
So I went up and introduced myself, and he was in, in the, kind of in his uh, supply area when I walked in. He goes, hey, come on back here. I'm just printing some stuff. And so we're talking. I said, oh, my goodness, this is like a printing press. And it was a printing press, literally. I know my grandfather used to run a printing company. He had a printing, a printing press. press looks like. Not a copier. He had a printing press. I said, holy moly, this is a quite an operation here. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, we do these dinner seminars. And I said, do you just make your own invitations? And he goes, yeah, it's way easier. And I said, uh, well, how's that working out? And he says, oh, it's great. And he knew his numbers, right? I do a seminar a week. I have 20 people at each seminar, and I make $100,000 in commission every single month. Unbelievable. Boom. And it costs me 20 grand to feed everybody every month. And it's all, it's all just a number. Just yeah. how, fast can I, how fast can I crank this machine, basically, was his deal. I found so. doing these, you know, we talked to Diane Enriquez, the New York Times reporter, who was the first person who got to interview Bernie Madoff. They also made that Bernie Madoff HBO movie based on... Right, yeah. Based on her work, when we interviewed her, she said that, you know, Bernie snowed everybody because he was, he gave off the vibe that he was fantastic at his job. And she said, actually, in truth, he was fantastic at his job, right? Yeah. He was his also, job just wasn't every, what he everybody was, thought. Yeah, it was. exactly. He was also fantastic at ripping you off. But I will tell you that in all of my years of doing those seminars, it isn't going to be your end all be all. You still have to check broker check. You still have to check referrals. You still have to go to the meetings. You have to use some common sense, right? If it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. But I'll tell you, the people that hired me to give those presentations for them, the advisors, the ones that in your gut seemed like people that you would get along with, by and large, those were the people you actually wanted to hire. The ones that you just got this rubbed the wrong way. And you could see people in the audience go, yeah, I don't know. I don't, okay, I'll sign up, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that probably wasn't the fit. It probably wasn't. Well, for me, it's a really big component to when we bring on clients. One of the first things that I talk about is it's got to be a good fit. You know, I, I say I've got 25 years probably to do this ahead of me. And if we talk to clients every six months, that's 50 conversations about your money, right? 50 yeah. conversations about your money. And conversation number 47 on that list to be fun and interesting, conversation number one ought to be pretty gosh darn good too. Absolutely. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, you know, if you, you kind of hate conversation one, you're really going to hate conversation 47. So I even remember know, that from the me, advisor side. really is really a big deal. Well, I remember that from the advisor side. If I was fighting with a client in meeting one, I learned as my career went on, I was going to fight them every stinking yeah. meeting. And it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it for well, me. That's, that's one of the criteria, right? It's got to be a good fit for the advisor, but it's got to be a good fit for the client as well. So, Yeah. Uh, the, the next two are interesting. Uh, video content. Creating in-house video content is also emerging as an essential component of marketing strategies. Uh, here's what I like. What about in-house audio content? In-house. Well, you know what? You could put the podcast here. I mean, for people like you, OG. But, but I think what I like about this, from a, had this been around when I was an advisor, what I like is, and of course, you got people that do the radio shows, right? I mean, I used to do a radio show in Detroit. <coughs> we, we, we used to do a radio show. <laughs> the, the, the thing that I Sorry. like. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I had a little, there's a little something there. I had to, sorry. The thing that I like about about that is that you can kind of test drive them for a while. I mean, the reason I like doing this is that, hey, you know what? I'm going to put out a show three times a week. You decide if you like what I'm talking about or not. You decide. And so, you know, programs like Guidevine, I like where you can look at the advisors and they do these videos ahead of time. Anything that lets you see a little bit into their world ahead of time. I think not only is that great marketing, it's it's better, once again, for everybody. You can see the fit ahead of time much, much more. Uh, next, digital ads. You know, my feeling about digital ads, I had a marketing person tell me this. Uh, there's a big attorney firm in Detroit, and I was talking about them and talking about, wow, they must be a big deal because they advertise all the time. And this other person looked at me and said, let me ask you. Do you advertise because you need more clients or do you advertise because you already have enough clients? And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Like everybody assumes that if you're advertising all over the place, that's the better firm. When really, I mean, don't get me wrong, it, it just doesn't. That sounds like a disgruntled attorney that doesn't have enough clients. For no. A big firm that's crushing them. No, it just doesn't say, it, it doesn't tell you it's a better firm. It tells you it's somebody that has a big marketing budget. Like you think that they're a big deal. It doesn't mean they're a big deal. People, I knew advisors that you couldn't go see because they were full. They were some of the best advisors in the business. You weren't going to get to them 
they were never going to advertise. You'd never hear about them. They got plenty of clients through referrals, and that was it. Well, I'll give you an example because I don't know anything about his work. And he's shown up on the Barron's list of top advisors, Ken Fisher, right? I was just going to say, what about Ken Fisher? But that, that's exactly my point. I don't know if Ken Fisher is a phenomenal advisor or not. I just don't know enough about Ken Fisher. I know I get tons of stuff from Ken Fisher. I get t- <laughs> tons and tons of stuff from Ken Fisher. I see him on the list, you know, on these on these lists of knowing what he's talking about. And I've seen Ken Fisher talk. So seems like he knows what he's talking about. But the fact that I get lots of advertising from him doesn't make him, in my mind, better or worse. And I think I think that's just kind of a fallacy that we have. Dovetail on that a little bit is also the concept of, you know, bigger is better, right? So Ken Fisher, using him as an example, I don't know whether or not he's a great advisor, his firm are great advisors or not. Of course, he's not really probably managing any money right now because right. he's got so much of it on his own plus you know, his firm so big with so many other people underneath him. And not to pick on Ken Fisher, by the way, this could be Rick Edelman we're talking about. Yeah. Well, exactly. Sure. So just because they have $70 billion under management or 40 billion or 20 billion or 10 billion or 1 billion or a hundred million or 10 million, uh, that doesn't make them good or bad, right? Some of that could have been intentional. Some of it could have been optics, right? There's advisors out there who acquire other advisory firms to make themselves look bigger, which by default, some people think is better, right? And that's not necessarily true. Yeah. And then the last one on here is, uh, well, that was the last one. It says, a, a takeaways, says, make sure you're highly organized internally, have a detailed process and follow up. Make sure you track all your data all the time. Obviously, those are geared for advisors. But because as an well, that's advi- true with any business, though, I mean, this this can be, you know, this is a advertising article about financial advisors. But if you're in any sort of business, when you're deploying money for purposes of acquiring new business, right, you need to monitor your spend and the results. Yeah, the, f- and, the and fact that it. the fact that that guy knew his machine, the one upstairs from you, yeah. knew his numbers. Brilliant. Just yep. just brilliant. Fantastic work. Our second piece comes to us from money.com. This cheap, easy home improvement project gives you the absolute best value for your money. I always wonder, like if you're giving your house curb appeal, which one is it? This is written by Shana Mushkin. Kitchen, bathroom, and living room renovations might be the most popular among U.S. homeowners, but they aren't the most valuable. That designation goes to a project that's a bit less sexy and much more subtle. Believe it or not, it's the garage door. Oh, gee. Replacing an old, outdated garage door with a new one can almost entirely pay for itself when it comes time to sell, according to Remodeling Magazine's 2018 Cost versus Value Report. While you may not think of the garage door as an object of beauty, replacing an old, battered door with a smart new one can make all the difference when it comes to curb appeal. A new door can give the front of your house a fresh, clean appearance, says Buffalo-based appraiser Jim Merritt, even if would-be buyers can't put their finger on the reason why. Other benefits too, like improved installation, which could significantly lower your energy bills, especially in colder states where it's been snowing in April. By the way, that's my continues to snow. My commentary yeah. on top of that, while it's 80 degrees here, and my uh, sister sends me a text the other day with snow falling over her head, a picture of herself with snow all over her face, and says, "What the hell's this? Yeah, <laughs> what, what yeah. am I, what am I doing? That. It's been cool down here, though." You know, not as warm as it normally is. I think it's really interesting that people, when they go and they look at their house, especially people getting ready to sell their house, OG, they, they you know, they think they hear kitchen, bathroom, and they look at the thing as, as, as if they live there. But you're really looking for what's going to knock the socks off somebody when they first drive down your driveway. And that garage door is a big one. Well, this just goes along with our first article about marketing. What are you doing when you're selling your house, right? You're marketing your house. So what's the first thing that everybody sees? The front. And if your garage door is in the front, it better look really nice. I think a corollary to this would be the front door, right? I mean, a fresh coat of paint on the front door. Even little things like flowers make all the difference, right? I mean, you drive up and down just your regular neighborhood and you can pick out the houses that, you know, that they actually care, <laughs> you know, with their with their lawn maintenance. Do you know what the number two was? Uh, no. Replacing the front door. Oh, look at that. It said that returned about 91% of the average outlay. Uh, it didn't look at touch-up jobs. It said like repainting or sodding your lawn. The most expensive projects costing $100,000, like adding bedrooms or major kitchen renovations, those typically recoup half or less of what they cost. You didn't get your money back. So it, that doesn't mean don't do those, right? This is what drives me crazy. People, you know, we talk about quality of life. 
people do right. all these home renovations when they're getting ready to move. And they, and yet think about if you did those while you live there. Like I right. remember that with our last house, like we're getting ready to move. I'm doing all this cool stuff, making my house look like the damn pottery barn. I'm like, man, if I had lived in this house, this would have been amazing. We, we did. We did the exact same thing when we moved. We, we painted everything on the inside. We finished the basement. You know, it wasn't completely done. It was kind of half finished. We finished it up. All said and done, I think we spent no more than like $3,000. And then we get done with the thing. And we're like, gosh, darn, this looks pretty nice. Fresh paint, smells good. The carpet's new. The basement's the way we wanted it to be. Anyway, pack your stuff, sweetheart. Time to go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't wait for all those things. So I think that's lesson number one. You know, resale value is important when you're selling your house and look at cost versus money, front door, garage door, things like that. But man, if you're going to live there for a long time, think about what was that phrase Vicky Robin used last Wednesday, like a uh, uh, cost per joy found or something like that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> like, like what's your cost for the joy? And I think adding that bedroom or the kitchen remodel might be still of a high, high quotient there. But the uh, second takeaway is being marketed to, remember to look through that and look at the quality of advice because every advisor has something that they're looking for and you want to make sure the two of you are on the same page. It's that time, man, where we dive back into the letter bin. Doug just dumped a bunch of letters here on the table. Man, we've got some great stuff. And our first letter today comes to us from Jim. Jim says, hey, Joe, longtime listener, probably the only listener. <laughs> You're right. You and mom, Jim, are the two listeners. So thank you, listener Jim. I'm 26 and have been investing in mutual funds, 529 and 401ks for the past five years once I started working full time. With that said, I haven't faced a market correction like this before, and I've enjoyed riding the gravy train, yum, gravy, of gains. <laughs> What's your advice to a young investor who doesn't have experience with this situation? How should smart millennials be reacting? Please don't ask Len because I'm sure he'll just recommend crawling into the bunker. Huh? Thanks, Jim. Great question. Somebody facing their first market downturn. I think the first thing a millennial's going to think, oh, gee, is the sky's falling, right? When it really, really, it's not. It's hard not to feel that the sky is falling when you haven't experienced it before or even recently, right? I mean, our last correction was in like 2011, 2012, and it's been five, six years, and all of a sudden the market goes down 10% in a couple of weeks, and you go, wow, that is a lot of money, like gone in, a, in, in just a heartbeat, you know? But I think it's really important to expand the time horizon, right? So identifying that this happens and being okay with the fact that it happens and also recognizing that not only has it happened in the past, but every other time that the market's gone down, it has recovered. Now, I can't prove to you that the next market decline will result in a market recovery. That's just something that you have to believe in your soul, I think. But at the end of the day, steeling yourself against it involves education around this happens. Here's the frequency of which it happens, you know, roughly once every five years, by the way. And uh, here's the veracity at which it happens. And, and more importantly, what's the, you know, what's that time frame look like before you break even on average 30 months? So at the end of the day, it's just being okay with the fact that you're trading away those five years of great market returns for an occasional period of volatility. As far as reacting to it, I like the phrase that I heard some time ago, great investors don't react, great investors act. If you're at the point of reacting, I think that it's too late. So one of the strategies that I think makes a lot of sense is to always have a little bit of extra, you know, we might call it dry powder, right? A little, maybe you see the market down 10% and you say, well, it's okay to pull back a little bit from my cash reserve. You know, I've got 20,000, but I'd be okay with 15 right now so that I can deploy that extra five because everything's on sale right now. So looking for an opportunity at that point is really important. The things that you can't do, I think, are also as equally important. The major one being now is not the time to reassess your risk tolerance. <laughs> you don't get to say when the market's down 10 or 12%, you know what, I'm really not this risky. I think I should take some money off the table because it's too late. You know, the horses are out of the barn. So that's not the time to do that, but rather stay the course, deploy more money if you can, and even simple things like just don't watch it. Right? And listen, I think that if you're if if you're thinking about taking money off the table right now, I think you've just turned investing into gambling. 
I think you're no longer investing. I think you're gambling that the market's going to go down further, and then you're gambling that you're going to know when it's going to come back. And I've seen discussions about this in places, I mean, places even near and dear to my heart, like our basement Facebook group, where people in there are talking about, hey, I'm taking money off the table. And we've got other people saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm thinking, but yes, there's a lot wrong with that. Yes, you have turned investing into gambling. And if you have a long time horizon, why are you going to gamble with now that market conditions are changed? I'm going to have a different asset allocation than the one that meets my goal. Yeah, Good stuff. So that's where I think the the smart money is, Jim. And I love, OG, I love your advice of buying, uh, you know, the strategy of buying the dips, even if it dips further, you know, okay, we went from a 10% off sale to a 20% off sale. I still got a 10% off, right? And hopefully... I can continue to invest. Like he said, he's in a 401k plan, right? He's still socking money away. When, when the market goes down, you see people that gamble there too. They're like, Oh, the market's going down. I'm going to, I'm going to peel back my change my holdings or whatever. I don't want to invest more. I'm throwing good money after bad. Are you kidding me? You're buying on sale. Keep buying on sale. Good stuff. Good stuff there. That's what I think the, the smart money does. Scott, uh, Scott says, new listener, love the show. Scott, see, Jim, you're not the only listener. We now have Scott, you, and mom. There it is. Uh, I've even learned some things. Wink, I'm 33, done a poor job of saving. Back in 2014, I made the decision to take control of my finances. But uh, I want to stop there. To be 33 years old and to say in a letter to someone that you don't know that you've done a poor job of saving and you decided to take control, that takes some bravery. You know, that takes some guts. So, because I think that's step one, man, don't you? Well, and I mean, just look at it. If he's 33 now and he says in 2014, he did this, that was four years ago. So he was 29. I can tell you, I was doing, I I still do a lot of dumb things with money, but I did even more dumber things with money when I was 29. So the fact that he identified it and uh, is working on it is fantastic. He said, fast forward four years to today and he's debt free. Oh, well, see, there you go. Isn't that great? But just make a decision that today, what's the, what's that phrase? Today doesn't have to be like yesterday. You're not the sum of all your past mistakes. Every, well, every day is a new day. Yeah, here's what I assume when I talk to people. I assume that you had a good reason for the decisions you made in the past. Now, looking back at those decisions with new information, you might recognize that they were not the greatest, right? Because you have new information now, right? You're five years older, you recognize how things change or whatever the case may be, but you can't evaluate your decisions five years ago based on today's knowledge. You have to assume that everybody is making as good of a decision as they can with the information at hand, right? Yeah. You know, you see this with people that say, oh, well, it was really stupid. I bought a car and had a car payment for three years. It's like, well, did you need a car three years ago? Yeah, my other one took a crap on the highway. You know, I was was tired of walking to work. Okay, now you made a decision with the information at hand, right? I mean, now looking back five years ago, you you could have said, well, maybe I should have ridden a bus or ridden my bike or bought a lesser expensive car, whatever the case may be. But that's, you know. That's side seat driving. You, you know, right. it's, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter at this point. It's a Monday morning quarterback. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I contribute fully to the generous match of my 401k, which is around $70,000. And I'll have a Roth IRA fully funded for the years of 2017 and 2018 by the end of May. Call my liquid cash effectively zero after all that. I'm able to save about 1500 a month. I know you can't give specific advice, but in general terms, how can I make this money work for me, but still have it liquid enough to purchase a house, travel, and still retire not poor in 30 to 35 years? Well, first of all, Scott, I mean, just to jump on this, <clears throat> you're not going to be completely poor. If he's already saved $70,000, it isn't enough. I totally agree. But at 33, if he's getting an 8% return on his money, Use the rule of 72. Every nine years, his money's going to double. So 33, that means that $70,000 is going to double when he's 42, when he's 51, when he's 60. And then let's say he's going to retire. You know, you talk about longevity. Say he's not going to retire till 70, right? That 70,000 he's already saved is going to double four times. That's not 70,000 Scott's got saved. It's 140. That's the first time. It's 280. That's the second time. It's 560. That's the third time. If he doesn't retire till 70, which I know is an optimal, it's not what he's looking for. Maybe. I don't know his goal, but but that's $1.2 million. 
that he's that he saved. So you've already saved one point two million dollars, Scott, toward retirement. Once again, if you leave it alone and put it in the right spot and don't play these games that we were talking about earlier with Jim, but he still's got some work to go. So what does he do from here? From a financial planning standpoint, you have to sit down and prioritize the timelines of these things. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to lay out, you know, here here we are in 2018. Here's where retirement is, you know, in 2048, 30 years from now. Uh, uh, what are all the things that you want to accomplish over that period of time, right? So sometimes we might put in there uh, college tuition payments and you've got three kids and you layer those things in there. You go, oh my gosh, that's button up right against the day I want to retire. Right. Or maybe I'll have a kid in college as I get into retirement. Yeah. You know, he, he mentioned a house purchase, right? So I want to save money for a house. Well, there's only so much money, right? You, you make X dollars a year. You have to put that on your timeline and say, well, where do I have the opportunity to have saved enough money to do that, right? Does it make sense to do the full Monty 20, 25% down 15 year mortgage? Or is it better to do 3% down FHA or 5% down, you know, and do a home equity loan on top of it so you don't have PMI or maybe PMI is okay with you. You know, you have to weigh all of those things uh, depending on your individual circumstances. But I think laying out when do I want all these things to happen and then you can start calculating pretty simply, you know, in five years I want to buy a house. I need X dollars. How much do I have to save to make that happen today? In 20 years from now, I'm going to start writing checks for tuition. Here's the inflation rate of, you know, how much do I have to save today to make it in 20 years so that I've got this money? And 30 years from now, I want to retire. How much of that money do I have to save? The other thing you have to remember is that your savings won't necessarily be linear. So the problem a lot of times with the financial calculators are just using a handy dandy HP and saying, hey, you know, I got 70 grand. I put a thousand a month in. I just use it as an example for 30 years at 8%. Yeah, you get two and a half million if you do that math. It's great. But in 30 years from now, are you going to be making the same money you do right now? Yeah. I sure hope not. Right. <laughs> I, mean, right. I mean, you're going backwards in a hurry if that's the case. You know, I mean, m milk will cost 16 bucks a gallon by then. You know, so your paychecks will increase. And as time goes on, we also have to remember to build in as you get those pay raises, build in extra savings. And you got to pay yourself first. Hey, I got a 5% pay raise this year. That's an extra $300, you know, a month of paycheck. 150 of that needs to go into your savings account day one. And you'll still get the experience of having a pay raise, but but better yet, you'll be saving on top of it. I think there's also a implied question here is, as I'm saving for a house, how do I make that money make money along the way? And it's a popular question. And I'll say that uh, I, I look at risk management first with that money. That's such short-term money, OG, if he's, you know, like maybe let's say it's a five-year goal, assuming it's a short-term goal. I want to look at making sure that money doesn't lose money first, right? I don't want a lesser house because my money lost money. So I understand that people look at interest rates on savings and they don't want they don't want to get these tiny interest rates on their money. But I, I don't want to buy less house. So what do I do? I put it in the safe spot and not take risk with that money. Yep, absolutely. Next question comes to us from Luke. Luke says, I hear Joe on the podcast talking about his love of board games. Oh, boy. What are his current Nerd. recommendations? I'm looking for some new games, those for adults or families. Thanks, Luke. Luke, Luke asked the right question. Well, we really can't talk about the adult games Joe likes to play. Wow. But no. uh, you can talk about <laughs> so, the family ones. <laughs> so awkward. That's so bad. <laughs> uh, you know, a great game, uh, just if it's your first game for a family, Ticket to Ride. I love Ticket to Ride. By the way, we did an episode on this back the day after Thanksgiving, one of the late November uh, episodes, we also asked uh, one of my favorite board game podcasters, Mark Johnson, his opinions. He's got a great podcast called Board Games to Go. It really is just him and his friends talking about board games, but that uh, that's a, a lot like our show. That's right. <laughs> after a while, if you're looking for games that are a kind of a fun introduction to the markets, um, I don't like games that teach anything. Almost like I don't like podcasts that teach us anything. I prefer I prefer games that kind of introduce people to concepts and then you go and learn about that later if you want to. But games that teach a lot, nobody ever wants to play. So I love the idea of Pit as an example. Have you played Pit, OG? 
Um, uh, probably. Everybody it's gets a bunch good. of everybody gets a bunch of cards. You're trying to corner the market in either wheat, barley, something, and all you can say is two, two, three, four, and everybody's screaming and yelling as you're passing cards back and forth. Pit is a fantastic game created around the turn of the century, not the century 18 years ago, but the century 118 years ago. Also, the game Stockpile is a really fun game about the stock market. A little bit of insider trading going on there. Another stock market game is called Speculation, and that's stocks going up and down, and you're trying to come out ahead there. Uh, games about running companies. Power Grid is a fun game. Vitico- mm-hmm. Viticulture is a great game where you own a winery, or maybe I just like wine. But those are those are a few of my favorites. Uh, for For families, though, just basic family game recommendations. Ticket to Ride is a fantastic first game to start with. Uh, Settlers of Catan, a lot of you can just find it under Catan, C A T A N. Those are great kind of first steps. My kids love Ticket to Ride, and they're 11 and 9, and they get it. They can play it well. They know the strategy. Just takes one or two times before yeah. for them to pick it up. So, and even for younger kids now, they have a game called uh, like My First Ticket to Ride or My First My First Ride. I don't know what it's called. It's, it's, it's a kid's version. There's also a kid's version of Catan. So, good stuff there. Uh, thanks for the question. You know what, OG? Time for you and I to uh, take a little break here. Go get some, uh, maybe some mom's lemonade upstairs. And uh, Doug, why don't we hit the trivia? Hey there, trivia nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, here on Administrative Professionals Day. And I don't think these guys really get what this day is all about. I mean, where are all the steaks, the beer, the, the hot apple pie, fellas? Come on. All I've been hearing today is Doug this and Doug that. Or where's the next letter, Doug? A little appreciation could go a long way, you guys. Jeez, and that's why today I'm giving a nod to my fellow administrative professionals with this trivia question. How many millions of administrative professionals were employed in 2016, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics? I'll be back with your answer right after this. Thanks to Slack for supporting Stacky Benjamins. We use Slack, the whole Stacky Benjamins team. It's a collaboration hub that lets you organize the whole team's work in easily searchable channels. So whether it's projects, interests, teams, or by office, all the right people are always in the loop. Relevant information is in one place, and new team members can easily get up to speed. Slack, where work happens, learn more at slack.com. Here's what's funny is that we use Slack in a lot of different ways. First of all, We have different channels set up for different topics, so it's easy for us to go back and search what happened on each topic. We have one for the FinCon podcast team. We have one for design, whether it's design of the site, design of the show. We have a marketing channel. We have a podcast work group channel. We have a social channel, and we have individual discussion channels between team members. Helps us reduce emails and streamline our communication, so all the tools and services we need in one place. In fact, we can go right to video conferencing right from Slack. We can organize our whole team with real-time messaging, video voice calls, group file sharing, searchable archives. Everything is all in one easy-to-use place. So for us, Slack saves us a ton of time and it improves our productivity. We don't have to search through emails for that one follow-up thing. We don't search through multiple systems to find what we're looking for. I didn't think we needed it first and we totally (laughs) needed it. And now I can't live without it. Slack, where work happens. Learn more at slack.com. That's slack.com. Stagger Benjamins is also supported by Magnify Money. How does an extra $450 in your pocket sound? You know, we walk into the bank and we just say, what do you got? And yet when it comes to our personal financial tools, there's a whole world out there as we see on our Friday FinTech segments. So if you head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, it's like getting all of those places all in one. So whether it's finally coming up with a way to consolidate your student loans, consolidate your credit card debt to get your act together financially, or if your act already is together to get a better checking account that gets rid of a lot of those fees, a savings account, which actually pays you some interest, right? Instead of a lot of the brick and mortar banks or playing the credit card reward game, whatever it might be, whether you're a beginner in your financial 
life or you're somebody who is looking to get more aggressive with your financial cleanup or more aggressive at finally just getting in control and getting everything all in one place the way it should be, head to magnifymoney.com using our link, stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And his mom says that'll tell him that we set you. Welcome back, trivia lovers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And good news, Joe just walked by and said, hey, Doug. Well, maybe he wasn't that excited about it, but he said, hey, Doug, you know what that means? There's probably a big gift coming soon for you know who. But for now, let's gift you this question. Before the break, I asked how many million administrative professionals were employed in 2016? The answer, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2016, there were 3.99 trillion, no, I'm kidding, 3.99 million administrative professionals. So we could just round that up to like 4 million, couldn't we? If you nailed that answer, congratulate yourself while also remembering to send your favorite admin pro a gift. You know, the one in the basement, the one with all the hilarious jokes that make your sides hurt every day. You know, who, you know who I'm probably talking about right here? I mean, we're all adults here. You get it, right? That really good looking guy. Okay, I'll just spell it out for you. It's the handsomest, funniest, smartest guy in the basement. You know, a certain neighbor. My God, you guys are slow. Uh, it's always fun to answer questions, isn't it? My favorite show. It, it literally is. Literally. And, and <laughs> I love when people say literally over and over and over and over. Uh, somebody the other day said, and literally, and I'm using that correctly, da 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 But let's literally, OG, throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's, or rather life insurance's most important questions. Our friends, Avon Life Insurance Agency, they're literally disrupting the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things you value most. Using literally correctly. And? Money? I don't know. How about family and time? Aren't those important? Oh. Don't those give you the warm fuzzy? It does. That's why they created a simple way to buy affordable and term life insurance online. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free estimate for coverage and learn about life insurance the modern way. And today we're uh, saying hello. We're throwing out the lifeline to our new BFF, Eric. Say hi, Eric. Hey, Joe and OG. I'm a big fan of your show and appreciate all the great work that you guys do. Although I don't often learn anything, I always have a great time. And in fact, I have learned quite a bit. And that's led me to this question. My wife and I are blessed that well, when we retire, we will have pensions. But still, our 403Bs are a big part of our retirement financial planning. And the company that our employer uses has been pushing us towards uh, target date funds for some time. So a while ago, I had put all of my 403B into the target date fund. Uh, their argument was that they would manage it and rebalance it automatically, and that for someone who was not very financially knowledgeable, it was a great option for me. But as I've learned a little bit, and as I did some analysis, I realized that when I looked at the different weightings of the asset allocation in that uh, target date fund, I could close to match it from the index funds that they also offer as options in the 403B. So I made a spreadsheet and looked at uh, what my percentages would be for large cap, mid cap, international and bonds and uh, realized that I could bring that gross expense ratio down from 0.61% to 0.05%. So my question is, does it make sense to do that or should I stay in a target date fund where they take care of the rebalancing and they also have probably picked the different funds and positions within those according to some uh, management theories that they have or does it make more sense to go with the index on my own, do my own rebalancing, and potentially get a lot more growth? My estimate was that at 6% average growth over 10 years with those different uh, expense ratios, I could potentially gain about $16,000 in the 403B. Look forward to your thoughts on this. And again, thanks for all you guys do and have a great day. Thanks for the question, Eric. And uh, man, that's great. He looked at his target date fund like we've told people to do, OG, and he's digging in going, hmm, can I maybe do this myself? So there's two components to this. One is 
the cost structure, which is partially why I don't care for them too much because it's just a fund of funds, right? And now to be clear, there are some target date funds that do have really low costs. And so you can check that box of a low cost target date fund. But in this example, you know, it's a little bit more expensive. Let's also be really clear on 0.5% versus 0.05%. No one is going to become ultra wealthy or completely broke because of 0.45% a year of their management fees. But there, I just said that, and now we're going to get a whole bunch of hate mail. But the bigger issue with target date funds that I have is the fact that they automatically steer you into a more conservative profile as you near retirement, as if retirement's the end, right? Well, once you get to 65, then you must need all the money that day. Well, that's not true. You need some money at age 65, just like you also need some money for age 95. Like the headline we did a couple days ago about forget about traditional retirement blocks of 25 years because people are living longer and longer. Sure. So the major issue that I have with them is not the set it and forget it or the cost structure necessarily, but it's the fact that it automatically makes you more conservative when you have the most amount of money that could be working for you at that point, right? So I've got an issue with that. That being said, I'll take the counterpoint also with that and say, if you have no ability to do this on your own or interest in doing it on your own, it's a fine solution. But it sounds like Eric sat down and said, wait a second, I can replicate this pretty quickly on my own and, and, and save a few bucks. Here's what you're giving up. You're giving up knowing when to change it, right? Because the fund manager knows when the allocations change. You're giving up the automatic changes that would happen for rebalancing. So you might not be able to time those exactly correctly. And you're also giving up the changes in the allocation relative to the efficient frontier, if that's how they do that. So those all those things you have to manage on your own, which is not impossible, but that's what you're paying the 0.4% for basically, right? Ultimately, here's where I come down on this. Do it yourself, allocate it, whatever you think is best based on your risk tolerance and timeframes and goals. Look at it once a year, rebalance it once a year if it needs it and save yourself the money. And there's a middle ground here too. I mean, if you don't feel comfortable there, I know that adding Bloom to the portfolio is ultra inexpensive. It's going to be less expensive than the target date fund. So they're going to beat the pants off your target for day fund doing really the same thing. I mean, there's your middle ground right there. If you, if yep. you just great, want to great idea. want to hand it off to somebody else, but I'm with you, you know, if you can change your smoke alarm twice a year and you're confident that you'll do that, why can you not be why can you not be once a year at 2 a.m. when it's going off? <laughs> if that's the way it's going to happen, unfortunately, your 401k won't go beep, beep. And if it's going to sit there, then you're in trouble. So then I'd hire Bloom. But if you can twice a year take care of this or once a year take care of this, I would rebalance once. I'd look at it twice. That's all I'd do, you know? And he said he talked about having low cost index funds in there. You know, if you look at a random walk down Wall Street, it's a great way to go. So I'm uh, I'm happy with both of those. The, both of those solutions, OG, way better, I think, than the target date fund. Thanks for the question. Uh, let's get back to our letters because we've got a bunch of letters here in the mailbag. By the way, we got a bunch of letters, but guess what? Only one person's going home with the uh, Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt. You know who that is? Eric, because he mm -hmm. sent the voicemail. So, Eric, uh, that, they'll be coming from us uh, here very soon. Our next question comes to us from Karen. Karen's got a few questions. We're going to break these up. Number one is, I'm really enjoying not learning anything in your podcast. I'm in a unique job situation where my job's going away. I really want to find my passion that can be my job. I have an engineering degree, but I haven't done engineering in years. I, I literally, see, she said literally, I literally get a high out of helping people connect to something they need. Example, on Facebook, I see somebody's got a dog kennel for sale. Another person's looking for a dog kennel. If I connect the two, I feel great. Got any idea how I can make money at doing that? Nope. <laughs> you know, I've got friends though that are in logistics and they will hook up, hey, people need stuff over here and I know this truck over here and even though a lot of the biggest companies do those with algorithms now, small companies still do that stuff. So if you could morph that on a scale where you're helping transportation, Karen, that's a job that uh and I actually have a friend who created that job for himself. He just created it. 
he just started hooking up these small manufacturing places with small truckers and then created, he said before he knew it, he's sitting all day making sure that this truck is going from this town to this town. While it's at this town, he searched around and found somebody else that needed stuff to go to the next town. So if you like connecting those things, a job in logistics might be for you. This reminds me of that book that you were a big fan of that I couldn't stand, Never Eat Alone. And I have to read it because I told you I listened to it on books on tape and the guy who who, who provided the audio was really bad. But, yeah, because yeah, uh, as you know, that book gets quoted all the time. Sure does. So here's what I mean by that. You don't have to have a job to be a connector. This is it's, what you're talking about is networking. And if you can be the person who is the problem solver, it doesn't matter what position you're in, whether it's logistics or engineering or whatever the case may be. If you're that networker that knows of how to, you know, how to put people together and things together, I think that's, frankly, I think that's a mark of a good executive. The guy, know. the guy at my, yeah, so become an executive, Karen. That's yeah, what we're saying. Yeah, senior vice president. That's what you do. Searching for. There you yeah. go. Just go into the bank and say, I'm applying to run this place. And, you know, <laughs> whose job should I take today? <laughs> But seriously, my uh, a good friend of mine is a is a banker. You know this guy, and everybody around Texarkana says the great thing he brings to the table is he's just a problem solver. And everybody banks with him, not because the banking services at his bank are any different than any other bank. It's because of the fact that Hal solves your issue, and it's and it's clearly just yeah, go here. Like if if I need to know somebody to talk to about X thing, even if it doesn't have to do with banking, I call Hal. Because hell yeah. knows exactly the place to go look for it. Yep. Yeah, good yeah. stuff. Uh, here's Karen's other question. She says, we're completely debt-free except the house. With only 97000 left, which we're hoping to have done in two years, married with two kids under the age of eight, she says, so we have a while to go to save for college. Everybody says to put money in a Roth, but w- with a soon-to-be-paid-for house, I believe we'll be in a lower tax bracket when we're retired. We won't need much money since we don't have a mortgage. We have about $500,000 in our company 401k, and we're in our early 40s. Do you think we should invest in a Roth or not? She's kind of on the on the fence. Well, if the question is, should I have any money in a Roth? I think the answer to that is yes. Absolutely. Should you have some? Sure. Well, and here's the bigger. And by the way, here's the issue here, Karen. You've got five hundred thousand dollars in a company four hundred one k, which I assume, by the way, you phrase that that's pre tax money. If you don't have any money in a Roth, or at least in flexible money, the only retirement planning you're going to be able to do when you're pulling money out is whether you take the money out or not. Because it's all going to be taxable when you pull it out. But if you've got that Roth pot of money, you can play some games then, which could be advantageous. Two other issues with that. Firstly, the 59 and a half rule, right? So there are some ways to get to your retirement accounts before 59 and a half, but they're less awesome. And then more specifically, the 70 and a half rule. You know, if you're in your 40s right now and you've got half a million saved already, it stands to reason that that might be worth two or three million dollars by the time you turn 70. And even if you plan on having a low lifestyle, the IRS has a different plan for you. And that plan is detailed out on a schedule that you can see. And it tells exactly how much of your IRA or your retirement plan you have to take out every year if it's in a qual- in a pre-tax plan, right? So so you may say, oh, we only need to live on 50,000 a year. The IRS says, <laughs> that's nice. We're going to need you to take out 200,000 this year. And so uh, that becomes really uncool. So should you have a Roth? Sure. Should you also have a regular brokerage account? Absolutely. What's the right allocation? Hard to say. But I think that you should definitely have some of everything because it gives you the flexibility. And Karen, in her question, she discounts college. She says, my kids are under eight years old, so I got plenty of time to save for college. You've done analyses before for clients where kids are just born they're looking at in-state public school. If they want to pay for all of it or three quarters of it, what do those numbers look like? Yep. About $400 a month per kid every month from the nanosecond they're born until they go to college. And if she has it, two. It, it, yeah. And so here's the problem. A part of the problem with that is that the cost of college is going up as fast as the market. You know, a lot of times we look at our goals and say, well, I've got plenty of time because my money's going to grow at eight or 9% but inflation's only four. If you look at the rising costs of college tuition and college costs, it's running right about seven, eight percent a year across the board. So you literally are, there's our literally word. We are literally, and I mean it 
correctly, paying dollar for dollar the cost because you will get no value from the growth because inflation will eat it all up. So don't wait too long on that. That yeah, uh, yeah, will it's surprise you in a hurry. There, surprise me. That's where most of my hair went <laughs> right there. It was not good. Uh, thanks for the questions, Karen. And by the way, congratulations on being almost all debt free too. That's yeah, fantastic. That's super, super cool. Kevin has a question for us. He says, "Hey, Joe, OG, and other not so honorable guests, been listening to the show in quotes for a couple months now, and I still haven't learned anything, at least of value." Because of this, I have no other option but to turn to other resources. What are the personal finance books that have impacted you the most? Thanks, guys. Kevin. Kevin, we talked about this a few days ago on the show a little bit, but not specifically which one impacted us. We said which ones we recommend. So let's make sure we put that spin on it, OG. In your life, which personal finance books have impacted you the most? Mm, I can think of a couple. Um, How's about um, Richest Man in Babylon? Yeah. Let's talk about that for just a second. So that's The Richest Man in Babylon, not a huge book. It's a fairly small book, and it's a very simple thing. What I really like about it is it's just a story. Yep, just a story. I love parable st- I love parable books that teach a lesson when I'm trying to learn a lesson. I don't particularly <laughs> like it when I'm not trying to learn a lesson, but, um, uh, uh, but that one does a pretty great job, I think. Uh, big fan of Think and Grow Rich, yeah. Napoleon Hill. Both yeah. of these books are... So circa 1910, 1920, you know, so just classics, right? Yeah. Over. Um, and then uh, from an investment uh, behavior standpoint, and we send this book out to clients a lot, it's called Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth. Hard to find on their normal channels, but there's probably a used copy somewhere and you can go directly to the publisher to buy it. Uh, uh, the author is Nick Murray, but I like his style of writing and I like the detail that he puts into defining what exactly is the market and what exactly is risk and volatility and that sort of thing. There's probably a whole bunch of other ones, but those are the three that popped in my head right away. I was late to the game on uh, Vicki Robbins' book, Your Money or Your Life, but that book has hit me hard. Uh, so that is impacting my decision-making currently. In fact, it has before, but now I have a much better framework of how I spend money. So that's a good one. Talk about behavioral finance. Like, what's your stuff to joy quotient, right? If I'm going to buy something and $5 gives me the same amount of joy as $50 gives me, why would I buy the $50 thing? Like, I've started thinking that way. I'm like, does this this really fulfill my stuff to joy quotient? I really wish you would have mentioned that before I got my allocation of my wine for from Napa this year, (laughs) because I'm going, man, this is going to be good wine. And to to your point, like after the first glass, does it matter what the second, third and fourth glass tastes like? You order one great bottle, one great bottle, and then a box portioned out over the whole year. And then a box of Franzia (laughs) just sits right next to it. Much better strategy. I got another great book uh, that, that you you said behavioral finance, uh, your money in your brain. Jason Zweig wrote that, Oh yeah, uh, which is uh, a really cool book about how your brain will play tricks on you with money. We still got to get Jason on the show. And I actually, finally, finally, he's notoriously hard to get to. He tells you he's very difficult to get to. And I just found a path to him, which is cool. So hopefully we'll have uh, Jason on the show very soon. Seven degrees of separation from... It's, Jason Zweig. it's it, just like anything. It's about finally knowing the right person who's got the inroad. And th- that will be really cool because he'd, he'd be a great guest here. Uh, for those of you that haven't read his stuff in the Wall Street Journal, it's unbelievably good. Really good. Yep. Uh, my, my big book, of course, when it comes to personal finance, the most even handed book on personal finance I know of is Rick Edelman's The Truth About Money. I learned everything I need to know about insurance from that book. I didn't get how insurance worked. I didn't understand why insurance is priced the way that it is. I didn't get a lot of that. But for a lot of my friends, it was the best teacher of how uh, tax strategies work. It was the best teacher of how investments work. And so even-handed, I loved it. It didn't have a, an ax to grind, and I really, really like that. You know, I like different books for different things, though, mostly OG. Like if you ask me for real estate, what do I like? Or for stock market investing, what do I like? You know, if you ask me what my favorite book on stock investing is, I'd tell you that it was it's Peter Lynch's Beat the Street, right? That that's a phenomenal book and taught me a ton about uh, 
how to look at uh, individual stocks, anything, and he's going to be on the show again, anything that Phil Towns written, I absolutely love when it comes to individual okay. stocks. And he's coming in the next eight weeks. I just found out, which is we can announce that now. He and Danielle Town are coming on the show, which is cool, making a second appearance. So those are a couple. Man, we could talk books all day. I just, there's so many good books that impact you. Those are our favorites though, Kevin. Thanks for the question. Our next question comes to us from Brian. Brian says, my wife recently quit her job as a teacher to run her own daycare. And I was wondering which would be a better option, setting up a SEP IRA or a simple IRA. It looks like some of the biggest differences are how much of a contribution the business will be making to the employee's account. My wife will have five employees working for her and we want to make the best choice for the business. Also, can we still contribute to a Roth IRA that we've been maxing out the last couple of years? Look forward to learning nothing. Hey, Brian, one of the things that you said, I want to do what's best for the business. The purpose of the business is for it to serve you. So you need to do what's best for you. That also helps the business, right? So you want to frame it in that regard. And so that'll help guide the decision-making of what plan you use. For a SEP IRA, everyone's treated equal, right? So from a contribution standpoint- Everybody meaning her and her employees- Correct. Everybody, her and her employees are treated equally. And the contribution technically comes from the employer. It's treated the same, like it's pre-tax and all that sort of stuff. But but you look at it and say, well, I want to give myself $20,000 as my retirement plan this year. Guess what you get to do for the other four employees? Same amount of money. Yeah, same percentage. Or same, salary, per- same percentage right? of their salary. Gotcha. Yep. yep. Some people don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, you go, I don't want to give the person that you know, man's the front desk, the same payout as other people in the company, including the owner. A simple IRA, on the other hand, will give you a little bit more flexibility, but you got to give everybody a flat 3%. You'll be able to contribute a little bit more probably to that, depending on your income. There's another option that you didn't mention, and that's a regular traditional 401k plan. Sometimes they can be a little expensive depending on your projections, but I suspect that you'll be able to put the most amount of money there. All of this boils down to however much you think that you want to contribute based on the cash flow of the organization, how much you want to contribute personally uh, through your regular payroll deductions uh, like you used to do. And then what the forecast of the business is, is it going to be high turnover with employees? Is it going to be the same five group, you know, five person group for a really long time. Is there a lot of profit in the business? So business owners come to us and say different things. Hey, I want to shelter some of my income for retirement is a different plan than, oh my gosh, my business produces $300,000 a year of profit. I got to figure out a way to get rid of that from the, from the IRS. I'm okay giving my employees 40 grand. So I don't have to give the IRS (laughs) 150,000. You know, right. And so, so it kind of depends on what the projections of the business are. If you're just looking to make a few dollars of contributions, I don't think whether, I don't think the SEP or the simple will matter. Here's the big thing. Simples need to be set up by October 1st this year for you to contribute for 2018. Your SEP, you can go all the way until a uh, tax filing deadline next year. Okay. So you got a little bit more time. Uh, and if you go the 401k route, that process takes much longer to do. Uh, but it gives you, I think, the most flexibility in the long run. Final answer to your question, can you still do the Roth? The answer is absolutely yes. Awesome. Thanks for the question. Assuming that you meet the income. Yeah, rate. right, right, right. Thanks for the question, Brian. If you've got a question for the show, head to stackingbenjamins.com and across the top of the page, you'll see questions for the show. Click on that. And uh, there we go. That's good. Look at the clock, man. That's all we got time for today. A long episode today. Thanks to everybody who asked questions. If you didn't hear your question, we're still getting there. We've got a long road to hoe now. But I will say this, that if you're looking to get your financial house in order right now, guess what? OG's taking clients. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG to get on his calendar and to get your financial house in order today. That's stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG. All right, Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? First, looking for the biggest bang for your buck when remodeling? Don't forget the garage door and your front door. Small prices to pay with a big impact. Second, being marketed to by a financial advisor? Ask yourself, what's the agenda in this advertisement? 
You can often figure out exactly what the advisor is selling and make a better match, if any. But the big lesson? If Joe and OG ignore Administrative Professional Day, just go up and ask for the raise. Take the bull by the horns. I did that a few minutes ago, and Joe agreed to a 50% raise. 50%! Oh, boy, you know what this means. Appetizers on me down at the Sizzler. Well... You know, maybe just this once. Don't get used to me buying every time because, you know, guys got to make a Roth IRA contribution once in a while. My God, you people are leeches. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and if you could only know what it really smells like down here. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Special thanks to Joe and OG for the huge raise. 50%! That's incredible! Based on my current pay of carry the two and the... Wait a minute! That is not funny, you guys! Welcome to the After Show, the part of the show that doesn't exist. I'm watching, we talked about John Mulaney recently, but I'm watching an, another show called The Startups. Have you seen this one? Or The Stand-Ups. The Stand-Ups. Each one is, it's almost like that old Comedy Central stand-up comedy thing where you have a different comedian each time and uh, just the guys doing stand-up. And actually, I'm just going to play, I've never heard this before. I'm about two-thirds of the way through the first one. This guy's really funny. His name is uh, Nate Bargazzi. I fly a bunch, and it's, it never gets easy when you fly. Like, you just think, like, every plane you're on is going to go down. <laughs> it's not, not in a dark, you know, you just, it's never relaxing. I've got on a plane once, and, uh, you, like, you ever get on and just look at everybody on it, and it just lo- looks like a group that would go down in a plane crash. Like, <laughs> for some reason, you're like, I feel like I've seen all of us before. Uh, I had a pilot tell us right before we took off that he was retiring, and this was his last flight. <laughs> You're like, all right, why don't you just say that when we land, dude? Like, we're gonna... It's not like we're gonna be different people. We're the same people. He's basically just like, either way, this is my last flight. So, what do I... All I can tell you is I'm not flying again after that. I'm trying to get better. Like when you travel now, you go to like different like uh, cities. It's like to like actually like go explore the town and like see stuff. I went to uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, and yeah, a couple of us. All right, and they have a big battleship there, and it's in like it looks like it's a river because you, you can see across. It doesn't look big, but it's probably part of the ocean. Uh, it's like one of those where you're like, could I drink that water? Could I not? You know. I don't know, but you can't ask that. You can't ask someone how water works. So, I didn't even go on it, but it's there. I just wanted you to not think I didn't see it if you go. Uh, But I looked up some other stuff to do. They have a thing there called Cape Fear Serpentarium. And it's uh, just a guy's house, and he has a bunch of snakes, lizards, and a crocodile just in his house. He has the world record for being bitten by a viper snake. It's seven times which is like, it's a record no one is trying to get. It's not, 
It's so many times. That's, he was bitten three times and then four more times after that. That's how many times he was bitten. <laughs> Three's a ton. And then four more after is just too many. But I was like, I got to go see this. This is going to be amazing. So I go and walk over, I walk in. Right when you walk in, he's got a lobby. He just tells these stories that are, uh, that are, that are funny. They're all kind of rambly. But I find, myself, I find myself getting into stories. He's so deadpan. And I like that in a comedian where it just seems like he's just standing up. He just seems like the friend of yours that would be at a bar and just goes, you know, uh, last Tuesday I went and I saw this thing. (laughs) Just I totally get the feeling he's entertaining himself. Anyway, uh, that's been good. Hasn't been great, obviously. Uh, Stand ups. You know, Chef's Table talking about uh, Netflix has a new episode out. Season four, baby. A week or so ago. I can't wait to look at that. I just started also watching a series on design, which has been really good. It's called, uh, well, and uh, it's called Abstract, the Art of Design. And it's kind of like Chef's Table, but it takes designers. And so the first guy does uh, covers for the New Yorker. The second guy uh, designs Nike tennis shoes. But to see the way these people think is really, really, uh, really fun. Well, you been watching anything? No, just billions. Billions is my obsession. Billions and billions Every, and everything billions. about uh, everything about a billion is my obsession lately. S- <laughs> I'm s- trying to have that in my bank account. S- speaking of season four, season four, Peaky Blinders, fantastic season. Adrian Brody is uh, the new bad guy on the show. He's with the U.S. Mafia that's now going after them. There's always a different gang that's infringing on their territory. And uh, this has been more brutal than any of them that I've seen so far. Been really okay. good stuff. So Peaky Blinders uh, doesn't get better than that. 